heard rumors this morning about a gal with a broken back being healed last night. But I, I think it happened at 6.30 this morning. I think they prayed throughout the night with her. And uh, she's probably asleep right now. I don't know that she's here. Maybe we can get her to testify tonight. Well, the uh, topic uh, on your um, outline was, was to be getting started in your church. And um, we felt better advised to teach on categories. Keep in mind that, contrary to popular opinion, the course Signs and Wonders in Church Growth is not technically a course on healing. Healing is just one of the areas of access of ministry of Signs and Wonders. And so it's, it's what we use to illustrate our thesis. The, at the seminary, I, I'm preparing at this time to teach a second course, MC 511, that will be called Healing in Church Growth, in which we'll deal with the specifics of healing. And in fact, I'm uh, going to offer that course in a, in a conference setting next February here at the facility. And so those of you that have lots of money and lots of time and lots of energy and feel like you'd like to learn some more, come back next February. We, we haven't developed the brochures yet and the date isn't tied down, but if you've registered, you'll get a, uh, a letter from us. I feel that it, um, it would be somewhat difficult for people to take that second course if they haven't taken the first course, but we might be able to work out something where they can go through the brochure, I mean the uh, tapes, and uh, get, it, get prepared that way. Because it, at the seminary it will be uh, a prerequisite to take 510 before they can take 511. Now in 511 we will deal, uh, approximately a third of the course will be on physical healing and be able to deal with it in much depth, more depth than we've been able to this week. A third will be on spiritual warfare, which deals with the, the whole arena of trying to uh, take back the ground the enemy has taken. And a third will be dealing with inner healing and demonization. And so um, those of you that feel led and advised and, and want to uh, pray about it and maybe come back again this next February. Let's look at the categories of healing. Oh, before we do that, maybe I ought to make mention. When, uh, when we talked about uh, getting started in our churches, I guess if there's anything that we want to encourage you to do is go slow. Uh, you've been through a very intense time here. In long days, long hours. You've seen things that you didn't even know existed, some of you. And if you go home and try to just, you know, talk about it and share it with others, you're going to blow them away. They're not going to believe you. Uh, even though you're a credible witness to them, they're just not going to be, you're not going to be able to transfer it that way. My encouragement to you is go slow. Go slow. The Lord will lead you. He'll give you those that you should share with, those that you shouldn't. Uh, if you have notes and tapes, share those with the people. But share them a little bit at a time. And begin practicing the art of healing. Keep in mind, there's nothing that will change a person faster than if you heal them. It changes their paradigm almost instantly, doesn't it? And so, uh, my encouragement is that you go slow. Second of all, those of you that are pastors that are really interested in seeing renewal in your church, I, I would advise you not to start at healing. I would advise you to start at worship. We have a course that Steve Robbins and I just taught on worship that's available now on tape in which we deal with the theology and philosophy of worship as we in the vineyard see it. And uh, we think it's a very practical course. We taught it in our Bible school here. And uh, uh, we would encourage you to take that, listen to it, uh, let a few of your elders listen to it, share it around, and take six months to a year just to establish worship as a foundation. There's nothing that changes the hearts of people like worship. And we would encourage you to, uh, to do that. Now, um, you know, we don't think we have a corner on worship. We, we, uh, we're grateful to God for what he's given us. Most of the songs you've been hearing the last few days are songs that we've written. And uh, the Lord has given them to us to express intimate, personal, one-on-one -on -one 
love and adoration to him. But we know that there are many aspects to worship that we've yet to grow into. And, uh, and yet at the same time, it is foundational to everything we do. We see it as our highest priority. Every time we gather, whether there's two or more, we worship. That has to be the foundation of everything we do. Out of worship comes everything else. And so if you're not in a worshiping church, and you know, not, not everything labeled worship is worship, right? Uh, if you're not in a worshiping church, uh, establish that as a foundation. Pray privately, but don't go home, pastors, and teach 22 sermons on healing. It would, it would just be really tough on the people. Uh, move slowly in that area. But, but move. You see, it, it'll come, uh, the acceleration comes after the first generation anyway. It's really easy at this point in our, our life. See, I haven't taught a sermon on worship, I mean on healing or worship. I think I've taught one sermon on worship in three years, and I've taught twice on healing in three years. And I preach, uh, you know, a hundred times a year here. So you can see, it's no longer necessary for me to even, because we do those things. Because we do them, I don't even have to teach them anymore. Now we have tapes and we, all have, we have courses in our adult training program so that people can be, uh, new people that are coming on board can be, you know, uh, familiarized. But it's not something I have to preach from the pulpit. I've been preaching on repentance the last four months. Because we weren't very good at that. But I even feel that that season is lightning now, and, it, and it, I'm looking for the Lord to speak to me further, and he's been talking to me more about the Christian walk. And so my, my point in telling you that is that we have to uh, be advised to take it easy. Don't go home and dump on people. Please, for your sake, I don't want you to call me when you don't have a job anymore, you know? <laughs> At the same time, I want to encourage you this light. If the Lord speaks to you and tells you to do it, you see, I have absolutely no tension about splitting churches. Paul was a synagogue splitter. Every place he went, he split them. I have no tension about splitting churches. Synagogue means church. I have no tension about splitting churches if God is splitting it. But if you're splitting it or if I'm splitting it, that's a sin. I have a lot of tension about that. So be prudent, be advised, be faithful, be responsive, be sensitive, be led of the Spirit. And give people a little time to learn some of the things that you've been learning in such an intense circumstance the last week. Now let's talk about categories of healing. I want to talk about these categories one by one. It's just an overview. If you're interested in an in-depth study, the third uh, series of tapes called Categories and Operatives that I have on healing teach these things in depth, in which you have uh, multiplicity of illustrations for each one. But I'm going to, to uh, sort of uh, survey them today so that you can go home with a, a grasp of, a, of an overview of healing as I see it. Let's look first at healing of the spirit. By definition, I mean this. Healing of the spirit is renewal and restoration of your spiritual life, your relationship with God. Sickness of the spirit is caused by an individual's own sin, and of course the first and deepest kind of healing is forgiveness of sins, which Christ provides in response to sincere repentance. Receiving his salvation results in the healing of our spirit, and an ongoing experience of his forgiveness keeps us spiritually healthy. I want to uh, draw an illustration from the life of David. David had a problem, a spiritual sickness, and he received a healing. This is referenced in 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 27. Most of us are very familiar with the story, but I'm going to take a moment and read the text and then draw some uh, illustrations out of it. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, Isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanness. Then he went back home. Then she went back home. The, whim, the woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. And so David sent his word uh, to Joab, 
Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab uh, sent him to David. And when Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. <laughs> Boy, when you're sinning, you're really in trouble, you know what? The cover-up. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. And so Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the, of the palace with all of his master's servants and did not go down to his house. And when David was told Uriah did not go home, he asked him, Haven't you uh, just come from a distance? Why didn't you go home? Now listen to Uriah. Here's a real patriot. Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in my tents, and my master Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open fields. How could I go to my house and to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. And so Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And at David's invitation, he ate and drank with him. And David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants, and he did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, Put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. And so while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. And when the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite was dead. Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, When you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up. And he may ask you, Why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know that he would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jerob Besheth. Didn't a woman throw an upper uh, millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thesbeth? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this, then say to him, Also your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. And the messenger set out, and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had sent him to say. And the messenger said to David, And the men overpowered us and came out against us in the open, but we drove them back to the entrance of the city gate. And then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall, and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. And David told the messenger, Say this to Joab, <clears throat> Don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack, attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. And when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. And after the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. And so we see that the sin of adultery led to murder and to a collusion for murder as uh, David used Joab to do his dirty work. And we can see in the context of all this a spiritual sickness that had come over David, and as a result... Uh, all of these acts, uh, these uh, terrible deeds were enacted. David, instead of being out to war, was at home being tempted through sexual desires. This is referenced in the second verse. One of the key uh, to the uh, enticement of David is the fact that he wasn't taking care of business. If he had been out doing what he was supposed to be doing, he wouldn't have been there to see Bathsheba and have been drawn into it. His sin of adultery with Bathsheba that's referenced in the third verse this resulted in pregnancy, which led David to cover his sin by blame shifting. For instance, bringing the husband of the pregnant woman home to make it appear as if it would have been his baby. And so his intrigue failed and faltered at this point, in that he had no way to calculate the quality of man that Uriah was. By this time, his sin affected the relationships, not only relationships uh, in the immediate uh, family, I'm sure, but it, the relationships with Joab, who had been a loyal servant. And now Joab is, has become a, uh, a uh, party to murder in order to cover the sin of his king. This, these relationships have, uh, and the uh, impact that it's had upon him leaves David in a, in a terrible condition that's referenced actually 
in which ultimately he's brought to a point of repentance that's referenced actually in, the, in Psalm 32. Let me read Psalm 32. Uh, this is uh, David's writing. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. You know, uh, the sin of David was heinous and awful. But there's one thing about David that characterized his life, and that is he knew how to come and experience the grace of God. As awful as the things were that he did, David knew how to get forgiven. David understood the mercy of God. And this psalm uh, beautifully clarifies issues of the, not only the salvation, but of how that mercy worked to cleanse David and cleanse David's consciousness of the fact of the things that he had done. An uh, interesting aspect of this uh, text is that in the third verse it deals with one of the dynamics of how sin can impact the body. When it says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day. On numerous occasions we prayed for people who had all kinds of conditions. I remember a, a, a person, uh, a man with uh, cancer in the bone marrow. And when we began praying for him for the physical, the Lord kept giving me a word over and over and over again. I had it six or seven times. But this was early on and I didn't understand the relationship. And it took me a while to catch on that God was speaking to me. And uh, the Lord kept, kept talking to me about anger, 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 anger. And uh, finally I, I, I uh, stopped and said, uh, Lord, explain, you know, what, what do you mean? Are you, are you trying to give me a word for this man? And the Lord told me that this man had been raised up under a father who had beaten him severely on numerous occasions. More importantly, the beatings were bad enough, but he had humiliated him in public with his mouth again and again and again. And this had created a, a major problem internally for the man. And he had gone through his life and, of course, passed that on, which is so common when you've been uh, handled that way as a child. So often you'll you know, become the same kind of person at a later point of your life. And there was so much self-hate, hate towards towards his father, hate towards, towards himself, so much anger bottled up in the man. And when we began ministering to him, we thought we were dealing with a demon because, boy, he shrieked and hollered and yelled. And uh, we, that was the first time we'd ever seen anybody ventilate like that. And we didn't know what in the world was going on. We were, we were sure we were dealing with a demon of anger. And we kept trying to cast a demon of anger out of him. But over, uh, you know, as the, the Lord helped us, uh, uh, finally we, the, he ventilated enough to get control of himself. And we could see that there wasn't any demon that, that uh, had been manifesting. That was just anger bottled up inside the man. Now, it was interesting that in that particular occasion in praying for him, that uh, it took about three hours of him hollering his head off, wreathing around on the floor, vomiting. Just, you know, it was a horrible mess. And uh, after about three hours, he finally got control of himself. And we talked through, you know, some of the incidents in his life and some of the scarring kinds of things that have been said. And we talked to him about forgiving his father. And uh, uh, we didn't know about role playing in those days. And so we didn't have anybody, you know, be his father and let him talk to him. So, but we did just say, well, look, now we want you to picture your father. And we want you to talk to him because his father was dead. So we want you to picture your father and talk to him too. Tell him that you forgive him for what he did. And he did do that. And that was spirit-led. It wasn't something that we had any technique or methodology for at the time. And he forgave his father. And it was really an incredibly beautiful moment, a poignant thing, where he just tenderly said, Dad, I, I've done now what you did to me, and I understand how it can be done. And I hated you all my life, but I realize now that you were a victim also. And that someone, probably your dad, passed it on to you. And I'm sorry. And I want you to forgive me, dad, and I want to forgive you. It was a beautiful thing. Well, at the time, we didn't see a correlation between what he experienced right then and, and physical healing. We went ahead and prayed for the bone marrow. But we didn't, uh, we didn't see any correlation at all. But a couple months later, uh, it, well, in fact, a week or two later, he went right back to work. And he hadn't worked for 11 months because he had been deteriorating so rapidly.
But he was feeling so good, he thought, well, I might as well, you know, make some money before I die. And uh, that was his attitude. That's what he said to his wife. So he went back to work, and that's been about four and a half years ago, and he's still back, in, back to work waiting to die. But um, <laughs> because as far as the doctors are concerned, he still has the condition. But uh, uh, the, the bone marrow tests don't, don't demonstrate that uh, he has it at, at this time, at this moment. But they, they, you know, the, the basic theory is that it will reappear at a later point. But whether it does or doesn't, he's had four, four and a half years of, uh, of health. And my perception, I remember one young man we had in our church. Uh, he's a dear friend of mine. And uh, uh, he was healed of MS. Uh, one night I was praying for him and... And uh, over, actually over a series of about three or four days, God touched him and delivered him of MS. And he went to his uh, neurologist to have a, uh, a scan, you know, uh, for MS. And uh, she's uh, it's a female. And uh, she ran a scan and she came back and she said, well, Mike, at, uh, at this time you don't have any symptoms of MS. He said, oh, great, I'm healed. And she says, oh, no, you can't be healed of MS. <laughs> and he said, oh, well, let me see if I got it right. I've got the disease, but I don't have the symptoms. And she said, that's correct. He said, well, I don't mind having a disease I don't have the symptoms of. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. As the text develops, it says, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. And then I acknowledge, I'm reading in Psalm 32, then I acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. And see, there's a point in time in which uh, David turned and acknowledged his sin and didn't try to cover any longer. You see, one of the tragedies of this whole thing was that Uriah's death was just simply to cover up another sin. One sin begat another sin begat another sin. Conspirators were drawn in. People were, were uh, drawn into the sin, into the execution as it were. It's a tragic thing how sin permeates and draws. And said, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And here it is. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Isn't that great? You know what I've discovered over the last few years? Most of us, Bible-believing folk here, have a theology of forgiveness that we've never actualized. We live much of the time with many of the sins of the past still functioning in our lives. Are you aware of that? A circumstance will come up and all of a sudden incredible guilt will flood you and you'll realize that in the circumstance it hooked something in the past that's really covered in the blood. But you've never really actualized the experience of forgiveness. And so it's, it's as live to you as though it had just happened and never been forgiven. You can taste it in your mouth. You can feel it in your bones. And so a very, very important aspect of, of inner healing as it relates to physical healing and healing of the spirit is receiving the forgiveness of Jesus. David says here, I confess my sins and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Some of us have come to Jesus, confessed our sins, and we, we understand that we've been forgiven, but we do not know the deliverance from guilt. And I would encourage you, if you find yourself often polluted with past sin, that you're in that state. And go to the Lord and meditate on His Word. And go before Him and seek the deliverance from the residue of guilt of past sin. You don't have to live with that anymore. It doesn't belong to you. It was purchased by Jesus Christ. And you do not have to live with that pollution in your inner man. You see, it's one of the primary ways that the enemy is controlling you. So many in the body of Christ today have a theology of forgiveness that we've never actualized. And so we, we can't minister. We start to minister and the enemy says, well, you, you can't minister. You're such and such. 
you did thus and so. Now that's one of the occasions in which he's using truth to make a lie. It is true, you did do such and so, but it's not true because you didn't do such and so. It's been forgiven, it's gone. It doesn't belong to you anymore. The enemy is using truth and making a lie out of it. And so you must learn, you must experience the forgiveness of God to get rid of the residue of pollution that's left in your inner man because it's the playground of the enemy. It's one of the ways he's controlling you and it's one of the ways that he entices you to sin. He, he will cause you to feel the feelings of past sin and then use that as a springboard to current sin. You recognize that pattern? It's common to most of us. And so the, the spirit sickness of David actually caused physical discomfort. My bones wasted away. There was also emotional and mental turmoil. Your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. God's answer was to comfort the sin through Nathan, or confront the sin through Nathan the prophet, as referenced in 12, 1 through 7. And to deal with David in such a way as that he had to repent and turn from the sin. Healing in the spirit. Let's look at another aspect of healing, healing of past hurts. By way of definition, while sickness of the spirit is caused by what we do, sickness of the emotions is generally caused by what has been done to us. It grows out of the hurts to us by another person or some experience we have been exposed to in the past. These hurts affect us in the present in the form of bad memories and or weak or wounded emotions. This in turn leads us in various forms of sin, uh, depression in a sense of unworthiness and inferiority, unreasoning fears and anxieties psychosomatic illnesses, and on. Included in this area of present-day effects of the sins of the parents in the bloodline of a person, and this healing of past hurts touches the emotions and the memories and, the, and can actually impact, be related to the person's bloodline. We'll talk about that later. Peter is uh, one of the prominent people in the Gospels that... Uh, uh, sinned in such a way as that it was, as I shared the other night, written down for all posterity. And referenced in Luke 22:31 is the denial of Jesus, uh, in which Jesus confronts Peter about the, it, this impending denial. And it says in 22:31, uh, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. I would dial up your awareness the dialogue between Satan and God over the servant Job when you think of sifting. In the material I just finished on spiritual warfare, I've developed this at some length. Many of us Christians are unaware that there is the potential for times in which siege and sifting can occur with the permission of God in your life. And these times can be incredibly difficult. And you can rebuke the devil and call, holler at God all you want and you're going to go through it. Many of us have, uh, in the early stages of attempting to move into new turf in the kingdom of God, have found ourselves under siege. We began praying for the sick and we had some early success and then all of a sudden everybody in our family is sick for six months. And we're praying and praying and praying and fasting and praying and rebuking and reading and talking and commanding and, you know, doing everything we know how to do and yet we just stay sick. Have you had that experience? Many of us have. And I found that often when we move into New Kingdom turf, we're challenged by these times of siege. For years I puzzled over that and I couldn't understand that. Why those things would be true. One day I was reading the parable of the um, sower and all of a sudden something connected that had never connected before. Remember the occasion of the sower throwing out the seed and when he threw out the seed, some of it went on the what? The pathway. Well, I grew up in Missouri. And, on, and I can still remember planting season. And there was no farmer worth his salt that would ever throw away seed. He would never throw it on the side and on the rocky ground and on the pathway. I mean, they put a guy away that did that. 
But one time, in 19, actually 1972, I was in Israel and traveling through the countryside and I saw some Arabic farmers farming in a rather crude way. And uh, uh, they, when we, uh, we stopped the bus and we were all taking pictures and I noticed that these farmers were plowing and the seed was already on the ground. And so I asked the, the guide, I said, that, why, why have they got the seed on the ground? He says, that's the way we do it here. I said, you mean you throw the seed first and then plow second? And they said, yes. I thought, well, that's fascinating. Well, one day, not too long ago, I was reading the scripture on the sower, and all of a sudden, the Lord reminded me of that incident. All the, I said, I'd never correlated it. And I thought, that's it. First comes the seed of the word, and then it's plowed into you through siege. The Lord lets the devil sick you. And in the process of that, you are refined and things are plowed in. And that's what siege and sifting has to do with. I'm not going to charge you for that, Bart. I just stuck it in extra. Okay? All right, now, because Peter set his heart on man's interests, and in another text in the, in the uh, Gospels it tells us that, he could not understand why Jesus had to die. And so he responded, not so, Lord. And Jesus had to rebuke him. He fought to the end in Gethsemane, but when Jesus was led away, Peter followed afar off, showing his despair and growing disillusionment. And again, I think Peter was uh, uh, confused by the dialogue between he and Jesus. Remember that Jesus, when he sent the twelve out, had told them not to take a sword and not to take a bag and not to do this or that? And yet, in, in Luke uh, 22, just before the incident of the arrest, Jesus turns and says to those guys, remember when I told you that other thing? Well, all bets are off. Here's the new deal. Now get a sword. In fact, they went out and remember, they came back with two swords. Now what I think, now, now this is, may jar some of you, so be careful. What I think is we see Jesus' humanity in this. I think Jesus was rattled at that moment. Now I know that most of us like to think of Jesus always in control. Huh? Don't we like to think of that? But I, think, I see his humanity in that. I think Jesus was shook at that moment. You read the text to see if you don't see it. I think he was shook. I think he desperate. You know, I've heard sermons on that, that Gethsemane experience over and over again. I've heard, I've heard uh, sermons on the, well, you know, at the Rock of Agony. And, and, and you know, uh, and, and they always picture Jesus in his, in his divinity in such a way as that, uh, that uh, you know, he would come back and, and rather amusedly look at his three buddies and say, well, you know, why couldn't you tarry, couldn't you tarry with me for, you know, they always say it in rather pious tones, couldn't you tarry with me for just a moment? And, and the, it's always used to illustrate the fact that the, you know, the spirit is, uh, is eager, but the flesh is weak, and, and we, and we, but God understands that our flesh is weak, and I don't think it was that kind of a thing at all. I think Jesus was shook. And I think he needed his, the support of his friends. And I think he was desperate. And I think when he came back those times to the, uh, from the rock and, and uh, called out to those guys, I think he was crushed that they weren't with him and helping him. Now that's my perception. You don't have to buy that if you don't want to. But that's my perception. You see, my perception is that when Jesus became man, he was really a man. He was God. But he was man. And I don't know that, that we evangelicals have a very good grasp of the humanity of Jesus. I think we've so emphasized the divinity that we don't recognize that aspect of, of his humanness. In any case, I think Jesus was sifted in those moments. And I think he thought better of it. When he saw how the impact on Peter's life, remember the guy's ear? When he saw what, what, what his being shaken had begotten in Peter, I think there was a, a degree of remorse. And when I get up to heaven four or five hundred years after I've cried for a while, if I get nerve, I'm going to ask about that. i got a long list of things that I don't understand <laughs> that I want to ask about. In any case... Peter's faith faltered, and three times he denied knowing Jesus. And this caused immediate condemnation and an emotional reaction and bitter weeping and deep depression. 
And it's clear that because of the trauma of Jesus' crucifixion, Satan was trying again to gain access to the disciples through their, this emotional crisis. And Jesus, but Jesus had prayed for Peter. And so Peter came all, out all right in the end, but I think he went through one of the most horrendous and difficult circumstances of his life. After his resurrection, Jesus personally came to heal Peter's past hurt. And he went to where uh, Peter's shame and despair had driven him, fishing. First, through the miracle of the large haul of fish, Jesus brought back to Peter the positive memory of his calling and thus renewed his hope. This is referenced in John 21, 2 through 7. Secondly, around the fire, he asked Peter three times, Do you love me? It's one of the most poignant and beautiful and tender exchanges in all the Bible. Do you love me? Do you love me? And Jesus interpreted Peter's bad memory of a threefold denial. Reinterpreted Peter's bad memory of a threefold denial. And Jesus simply believed Peter's hesitant yet honest commitment. Lord, you know that I love you. And I think under that profession is, Lord, you know that I love you, but you know also the limitations of that love. You know how I was rattled. You know what I did. I can't, I can't pretend to be anything different than I am. This is all that I am, Lord. But in the context of that, I do love you. And Jesus recommissioned him then to feed his sheep. I believe that this healed Peter emotionally, which in turn renewed him spiritually and relationally. Now in this uh, uh, exchange, or in this dramatization in, in, of uh, Peter's exchange with Jesus, it wasn't a drama actually, but, I mean it was a real experience. I think we have a type of the healing of past hurts. I think that when, when you've hurt yourself and or been hurt by others, that there's a point in time in which you must go to Jesus and get, get the, all of those circumstances reinterpreted in the light of his mercy. The limitations that we have in the area of, of forgiveness of self is one of the most uh, terrible limitations that we can have. So many people have superficially exercised confession of sin and superficially exercised forgiveness and never really actualized self-forgiveness. To forgive yourself for your humanity, for your weakness, for your carnality, for your fallenness, for all of those things that have controlled you and from time to time caused you to be something less than what you had hoped you would be. And my encouragement to you is that you remember the vision I had of the, of the bank, of, of the cloud bank, and the mercy of God. Quite regularly in my life, I don't know how often, but probably seven or eight or ten times a year, I visualize, I go through what, a, a visualization exercise. I don't know if you're familiar with that term. But I picture... One of my favorite uh, old hymns was um, A Fountain Filled with Blood. And I, I know all the words to that and I sing it. I like to sing it. And often I'll go out in my backyard and sit for a while and picture that fountain. And walk through that garden and come to that fountain and picture myself looking down into the, to the fountain, to the well. I picture a well. And into that blood and seeing my own image in the blood of Jesus. And, I'll, and I actually visually, you know, picture myself reaching down and taking a bucket full of blood. And pouring it over myself. And I do that because I need to revisit forgiveness. I need to know the forgiveness of Jesus. I have been so contaminated by my sin and the sin that's been sinned against me. There's been so much that's gone down in my life that without that, I would live all the time with the enemy having access to me. I referenced the text the other night where I said, Jesus said, here comes the Prince of the Power. And he has nothing in me, the prince of this world, and he has nothing in me. 
And I have found that in my life that many times the devil has been coming towards me and he had something in me. He still had a place. He still had something. He still had some work that he had done. Some things that had really never been cleansed, never really been purified. And I found that by going through this visualization exercise and, and remembering the nature of the blood of Jesus. And I've memorized many, many texts in those areas. And often while I'm walking through that in my, you know, mind's eye, I quote those texts to myself. And always there's, a, there's an incredible experience that, that awaits me in that exercise. And, and I know the forgiveness again and it always reduces me to sobbing, recognizing this great thing that has been done for me and for you. That we can, that we can be forgiven by a loving God. And I want to encourage you if you've still got a lot of junk left in your bags, unpack them. Get that stuff out of there. Sufficient unto this day is the evil thereof. You're going to sin 60 times before or so before tonight anyway. Or six or 600, depending on where you are. And we need the forgiveness of Jesus. We need to actualize it, walk in it, be freed in it. That we may know his mercy and his love in a fresh way. Healing of the body. By way of definition, sickness of the body has its root in physical factors, either organic or functional disorders. Therefore, healing of the body means changing and restoring the physical condition so that the body functions properly. Of all the kinds of healing, physical healing is perhaps the most difficult for us to really believe in. That is to say, we in the Western world. It seems far easier to pray for something spiritual than something physical. In Mark 2.9, it says, Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or take up your bed and walk? Miracles frequently occur in the area of healing the body. For instance, the man is born blind in John 9. Now this Mark 2.9 reference is also picked up in the Matthew, the ninth chapter. And uh, it was in that particular reading that God spoke to me most profoundly in my early on adventure into, into healing. It was that text that launched me into healing. I was reading that text one night. Actually, I wasn't reading the text. I remember now. I was praying one night. I was at a, at a Bible study. And uh, the teacher was teaching. And it was something I, I just didn't, I, wasn't, I couldn't stay with it. And so I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what do you want me to preach on Sunday? And the Lord spoke to me and said, preach on healing. This was during that period, that difficult time, you know, and I was already want, burning out on it. And I said, Lord, I don't want to teach another sermon on healing. And I said, besides, it really bothers me when people aren't healed. And so he gave me a text in Matthew, the ninth chapter. And I, and I turned and I looked, I looked up the text and, and, oh, and I said, it really bothers me that people aren't healed. And besides that, I don't know if we're supposed to, uh, uh, to heal the sick. And, I, and I, uh, he gave me this text and I looked up and, and it says, and they were, they were awestruck that God had given such authority unto men. And I said, Lord, you mean we have the authority to heal the sick? I, I had closed the Bible and he, and he again, he gave me a text out of Matthew. Well, anyway, the, what the text is, is the story of the healing of the paralytic. And if you recall, when, as that paralytic was being brought to them, uh, those that were, the, that were carrying him uh, had faith. Jesus said, the scripture says, Jesus seeing their faith said unto him, your sins are forgiven you. Now, I couldn't see the correlation between his physical condition and sin. At that time, I had no inkling of it. And evidently, it was a problem also for the scribes because as they were watching, they were antagonized by this statement. Jesus, receiving a word of knowledge, turns to them and says, why think ye evil in your hearts? And I thought, well, I, I remember that particular night reading the text and I thought, well, Jesus, that's not evil. That's good theology. They understood. They understood the Old Testament uh, proposition for uh, forgiveness of sins. They knew only God could forgive sin. And they understood that they were the proper ritual. They understood what they were to do to get forgiveness of sin. And then the Spirit of God spoke to me and he said, but the, the evil is that they didn't recognize Jesus as God. 
And all of a sudden, boy, I, I was hooked by the realization that for years, I had not been recognizing Jesus as God in these areas. That I'd been hiding behind good theology. And that was a, a pivotal point for me when I recognized that there was teaching keeping me away from God. And I said, oh, Lord, forgive me. And then again, I sort of you know, rallied. You know how you'll do. You, you want to be true to what you've been taught. And I said, Lord, but I still don't understand. I said, uh, why the forgiveness of sin and, and, and all? I mean, I, I don't know. What about all the people that don't get well, Lord? You ever heard that one? And as I was reading the text, he, he said to the scribes and Pharisees, why, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you? Or rise, pick up your bed and walk. Well, I mean, the Pharisees, I mean, the scribes, they, they couldn't have done either one. They were prohibited by limited power on one hand to say, get up and walk. And they were prohibited by their theology on the other hand to say your sins are forgiven you. They couldn't do either one. But the Lord all of a sudden reversed that order and spoke to me. He said, John, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you? Or rise, pick up your bed and walk? New application. I thought, well, Lord, we know how to say your sins are forgiven you. It's pick up your bed and walk that we're having trouble with. And he said, John, he spoke to me very clearly. He said, John, what about all the people that don't get saved? Are you going to quit preaching the gospel just because some people walk away? I said, no, Lord. He said, well, why don't you let me worry about the ones that don't get healed? You just work on getting the ones healed that are able to. Well, that changed my life. It had incredible impact. I mean, when I tell it now, I, I can't tell it dramatically enough. But that was a pivotal point. Because I suddenly saw a correlation between action and belief. And I realized that I had committed myself years before to preaching this gospel of salvation. And I wasn't going to quit preaching it because some people couldn't receive it. But I had never tied it together with healing. And when I saw that the text itself was tying it together, you exegete it. It's there. He ties it together. And I suddenly realized that if I were going to, to minister healing, I was going to have to do it with a lot bigger commitment than I had been doing the four or five weeks before that, in which I was just sort of uh, routinely covering the ground in Scripture without really committing myself wholeheartedly to the idea that people would be healed. Healing of the body, then, is a very important aspect of healing. One of my favorite stories is the healing of blind Bartimaeus. Do you like that story? I love it. This is referenced in um, Mark 10, 46-52. Let me read the text. Then they came to Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Remember the other night I was telling you about this? This is one of my favorite stories. This guy is yelling his head off. I want you to note the apostles. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more. Don't you love him for that? Here he is, he's blind. You know, I just picture him, you know, <laughs> they're trying to make him be quiet. Son of David! You know? <laughs> Jesus turns and stops one of the other texts says that the apostles had that attitude too. Jesus stopped and said, call him. And so they called the blind man. And again, that other text demonstrates that the apostles had turned. And I shared with you the other night, you know, that all of a sudden their attitude is entirely different. Isn't it amazing how people broker favor and power? It's a sinful thing. But they do that. You know... <laughs> It's so insidious, this fallen nature of ours. If God shows you a little mercy and uses you for a moment, you're so stinking corrupt that you'll build a monument to yourself for the next 20 years. 
let's take it on the road, you know, and do something with it. <laughs> Isn't it terrible? One of the reasons why we didn't go teach anyone else for three years was because I abhor that so much. And then finally God spoke to us and said, I want you to teach. I want you to go, go out and share with people. And he spoke so profoundly that we knew we had to. But, but I hate that. We Americans, are, uh, particularly Americans, all right? You Can Canadians and English people can relax now. <laughs> we Americans, we're so self-manipulating. We, can, we can't even read a book. We have to give it away on the way home. Don't we? You can't listen to a tape. You can't, you know, oh, you know, let me share it with you. And uh, <laughs> we, just have, we just have to, well, we, I mean, we do, don't we? It's tragic. And we're so focused on, on being successful and being somebody that we can hardly receive anything from God. It's absolutely amazing to me. You know, somebody will fight tongues for years. You know, boy, it's of the devil, you know. And then they'll, they'll have an experience and God will show mercy and they'll, they'll receive tongues and they'll go right home and preach to everybody. I told you so. <laughs> and, you know, they've changed their theology. To be right is so, such a high value to us. And we're all like that. We're all like that. Aren't we? We're all like that. But Bartimaeus, man, he, he's going to go for it. He's going for it. He doesn't care what anybody says. He doesn't care what they do to him. He's going to get an audience with the son of David. And he's yelling his head off. And Jesus turns and says, call him, bring him to me. And so they call the blind man. Cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. <laughs> And throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. Don't you like that? I love it. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus said. Now, can you imagine? Here's a blind man standing in front of him. What do you want me to do? Scratch your nose? You know? <laughs> Did it puzzle you last night when Ken Copeland kept saying to that gal, What do you want? What do you want? See, he was prompted of the Spirit of God to do that. If you'd have heard the whole interview, she didn't come up there for healing. She came up there with a friend who wanted healing. He didn't know that. But the Spirit of God was prompting him to say, What do you want? What do you want? Well, what do you want? Name it. You see, there's a point in time in faith in which you have to just let it all out. And you have to take a chance and say, what I want is to be healed. Well, Bartimaeus didn't have any problem. Look at, look at him. <laughs> what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. <laughs> Don't you like him? <laughs> no confusion there. <laughs> Jesus says, go, your faith has healed you. Whose faith? His faith. Go, your faith has healed you. How did he demonstrate his faith? By being obnoxious. <laughs> by being pugnacious. By pressing in. By making a fool of himself. By yelling. By... <laughs> getting what he needed from God. Now where is that today in the church? You know something? I don't know how many times I've had people come up to me and say, Oh, you know, I've tried to get the gift of tongues, and I've, you know, I've, I've had many people pray for me, and I've tried to do it. And, and I've been praying for the sick, and I've been trying to heal people, but I can't heal anybody. And, you know, it's just, it's not working for me, you know. And I, I got Francis McNutt's book, and I've got your tapes, and, I, and I've been to three Ken Copeland meetings, and I still can't heal the sick. And, and I, you know, I, I'm trying to get a witness in my heart. Now, they don't really say it like that, but that's what's underneath. And what I always tell them is, be an animal before God. <laughs> C 
seek Him. Call out to Him. Yell until you can't yell again. Fast and pray. Read the Word. Stay up night and day until God comes to you. People somewhere, someplace, somebody's got to go to the well. We spend our lives living on someone else's going to the well. But somebody has to go to the well. Why shouldn't it be us? Someone's got to climb the mount. Someone's got to go to God and meet Him and come forth shining. And my encouragement to you is you go to it. I'm going. <laughs> Bartimaeus, go. Your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along. Now, I've got several questions on this, and someday I'm going to sit down with Bart <laughs> and have some pastrami. Aren't they going to serve pastrami in heaven? I'm going to sit down and have some pastrami and say, Bart, when did your eyes open? Was the first thing you saw his face? Wouldn't that be hot? <laughs> Blind all your life, man, and the first thing you see is Jesus looking into you. Whoa. <laughs> or, or did you, in obedience, turn while you were still blind and leave his presence? and see as you went. That's pretty hot too, isn't it? <laughs> At what point did your faith connect? At what point was, was it evidenced that all that he had just said was true? See, it really doesn't matter because anything he tells me is going to blow me away. <laughs> isn't it? I'm so proud of Bartimaeus. I love him. I do. I'm proud of him. Because he re represents for me a type of people that are going to go to the throne of God and get what they need from Jesus. I think Jesus is proud of him too. My encouragement to you today, people, if you've been here all week and you're still sick of body, you're here and you're not, you haven't received yet what you want from God, you go to Jesus. And you hound Him. And you call out until the heavens are just full of the din of your voice. And so... Getting rid of the presence of a demon may just be the initial step that requires several other steps before you actually bring a person to full restoration. We find that the aftermath of an of a episode in which we expulse demons or expel demons is uh, sometimes uh, months of uh, hard work of counseling and interaction with the person bringing them around to a place of wholeness. Often I'm asked in these kinds of uh, seminars, and uh, you know, what, what, where do you place uh, nurture, Christian nurture, teaching, uh, pastoral counseling, uh, counseling in the psychological or psychiatric realm? Uh, I want to encourage that we are committed to all of the resources that are available to us. And that often, uh, once you've gotten rid of the demonic presence, you may use all of the above before you bring someone through to a place of real wholeness in their life. I mentioned uh, yesterday that sometimes the demons, the presence of demons are the, even as awful as that is, uh, really not the most crucial step in helping someone. I remember a, a young woman that I was attempting to minister to. Uh, this young woman was 22 years of age had had a long history of molestation as a child. Uh, her mother had been uh, through several uh, marriages and affairs. Uh, she had been used sexually uh, uh, by several different men. 
as a child. By the time she was 13, she uh, was already working uh, as a hooker and uh, on drugs. From the time she was 13 to 22, she spent seven of the year, those years incarcerated in various kinds of institutions. Uh, she had had two or three children, I'm, I was never sure, uh, during that period of time by various uh, sexual mates. Uh, she had gone through uh, uh, several court incidences in which the children had been taken from her because she had continued a history of uh, uh, molestation herself. At the time that I met her, there was no living human being, no relative or friend that would any longer give her any resources. There was no one that wanted to take care of her or help her. She was uh, a cocaine user. She had uh, just been released from the our county facilities, uh, labeled manic depressive. Uh, she was, uh, I think, uh, it looked to me like symptoms of yellow jaundice, uh, uh, and she, uh, I, you know, I'm not a physician, so I wasn't absolutely sure, but she was emaciated, worn down, haunted. The demons were manifesting constantly as we were talking, uh, alternately answering uh, questions as, she was, as I would dialogue with her. And frankly, of all the problems that she had, the demons were, you know, down the scale. She needed a place to stay, someone to care for her, uh, food, uh, medical treatment, uh, psychological treatment, she needed counsel, she needed Christ, she claimed to be a Christian. She may have been, I don't know. She needed the demons expulsed. There were, I mean, it was a rather, I mean, talk about a massive set of problems. In our attempts to minister to her, the first thing I tried to do was secure some sort of housing, some place that we could keep her for three or four weeks so that as we began ministering to her, we would have a place, to, you know, some resource to work out of. Um, we took a day to do that, and in the, and in the meantime, she disappeared. Tragic. But I want you to know, there are many such people. And we have, need to develop some sophistication in our thinking about the care of human beings. If we're going to be effective in ministering at this time and age, you see the enemy has become rather sophisticated in his ability to destroy. But in my opinion, there's nothing the enemy can do to a human being that Jesus can't undo. But Jesus needs people to use as resource to do this work. And that means you have to get involved. And we have to move from something other than an institutional form of Christianity to do that. Parading in and out of buildings to be entertained week after week is not the ultimate goal of the, of the Church of Jesus Christ. And it's my perception that you and I have been called to the conflict, called to do the stuff. And if we will do it and do our part of it, we will see people like this young woman healed and brought back. We have them in our church that have just as massive a history, just as difficult a background, and they're functioning. I like that. For years, I was on a pastoral staff where we had a residue of people, ever-growing number of people that we could not help working out of the theological grid and out of the educational grid that I was working with, there were many people that slipped through the cracks. People we could not meet their needs. Their, their behavior was too aberrant. Their background was too incredibly difficult. Their sin was too sophisticated. And on and on and on. And we just couldn't help them. And that's why I left the ministry in 1974. And when God began speaking to me about coming back, I said, Lord, the only way I'll ever go back to the ministry is if I can see your ministry. I want to see people help. 
Well, I'm catching some glimpses of it these days. <laughs> Things are looking up. One example of uh, demon expulsion is the Syrophoenician woman's daughter. It's referenced in Mark 7, 24 through 30. Jesus left that place and went into the vicinity of Tyre, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia, and she begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And then he told her, for such a reply you may go. The demon has left your daughter. Now there's a pronouncement. Remember we talked about that? There's a classic pronouncement. And she went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Now this woman came to Jesus on behalf of her daughter who was demonized. And there's no mention of the nature or of the demonization. That is to say the kinds of manifestation. As in the case of the child that the, the apostles couldn't cast out the demons, where the, uh, the demons were tossing the child into uh, you know, fits and then tossing into fire and water, there's, there's no reference that tells us the nature of the manifestation. But keep in mind that when there are demons present in a person, there usually are, uh, there's usually a history that you go on the natural plane you can relate to and understand. When, uh, often when we cast out demons, as we've gone through the interview phase, uh, the person's told us about a persistent type of behavior that's occurred again and again and again and again. And when we begin casting out the demons they, uh, and they respond to us, sometimes we, we allow them uh, some dialogue, but most of the time we just cast them out. But sometimes in order to really find out the nature of the work they've been doing so that we can be sure that we've got them all, We'll ask them, what is their assignment? What do they do to the person? And invariably, they do the very thing that's been this long, they've had a long history of. So there's a correlation between the demonic presence and the kind of behavior that's been exhibited by the person. Her faith was the main factor of her daughter's healing. This mother had an amazing persistence and shamelessness. And again, like Bartimaeus, she pressed in where others might have turned. She also trusted in the mercy of God. Even the dogs can eat the crumbs, she said. And Jesus obviously was affected by this statement. He responded to it and responded to it with mercy. This is the only occasion, by the way, in the New Testament where there seems to be any hesitancy whatsoever for Jesus' healing. On the occasion of the nobleman's son, there was dialogue but immediate healing. On the occasion of Jairus' daughter, Jesus got right up and was ready to go, if you recall. And on the way, uh, healed the woman with the issue of blood. Uh, on the occasion of the uh, centurion servant, Jesus said, yes, I'll heal him. And so the only place in the New Testament where we see Jesus hesitating at all is on this occasion. And he's clarified why. And that was that his primary ministry was to the, to the house of Israel. The children. Now, if one of the most profound statements, I think, on healing in the scriptures is, is here when Jesus says to her, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. People, healing is the children's bread. Healing is a staple. It's to be the norm, normal practice of the church. Healing is the children's bread, not cake, bread. It's to be a staple in the life of the church. Healing is the children's bread. Healing is the children's bread. <laughs> Have you got it? Is it underlined? Never forget it. You know, at our house, we had four kids, three boys and a girl. And uh, when we called them to dinner, they came, and uh, they, they would say, please pass, or may I, or something like that. But they were never refused. I don't know a time that we ever refused our children any food that was on the table. 
There were occasions in which they, we, they couldn't get other food. You know, they, they had to be disciplined at that point. But everything that was on the table was for the children. Get it? <laughs> Jesus has, in, has set a table. And he told us to go into the highways and byways and bring people to the table. Everything on the table is available. You need a little something? Just say, please pass the salvation. <laughs> please pass the mercy. Please pass the deliverance. Please pass the healing. I like a little forgiveness and mercy on my healing. <laughs> pass me some more, please. got it? We never required our children to get up from the table, fall on their faces, and beg. <laughs> oh, why won't you give me some bread, Daddy? He's a cruel Daddy. Was not the normal practice at the Wimber House. Are you hearing me? And it's not the normal practice with Jesus either. This is the only occasion in Scripture where he even hesitated. And she got what she wanted. Get it? All right. Now, don't ever say this again. I know he can heal. I just don't know if he will. He's already gone on record. He will. You say, well, what about the people that don't get healed? I want to tell you something, folks. The problem isn't on his end. When people aren't getting healed, the problem is down here. It's in the other end of the hose. <laughs> That's where the kink is. Cross my heart. That's the way it is. And so the Seraphonician's mother came, and it was her faith that was the factor for the daughter's healing. Jesus pronounced the healing. For such a reply, you may go, the demon has left your daughter. The amazing thing is that the healing took place over some distance. The demon left the child when Jesus spoke miles away. Now, I've never, that I recall, had a, a, an experience where I've cast a demon out at a distance. But there are those that I know uh, quite well that have on numerous occasions healed and cast demons out over the telephone. I've never had the experience of doing that. I don't know whether it's a, a limitation of my faith or, or what, but it hasn't happened. I've tried a few times. I have had the experience, which is very gratifying. I don't know how many times I've had somebody write me or call me and say, I just got your tapes. In fact, I just got this one the other day. I think this one's from um, Colombia, if I remember right. Uh, Central or South America, somewhere down there. And um, uh, a missionary, a covenant missionary had written me a letter and we sent them some tapes, which is kind of our normal practice. And uh, they had just gotten the tapes and were listening to the tapes. And someone that was uh, a woman that was in their church that I think had some sort of an elding kind of responsibility, but also worked around the house there, had come in and was listening to the tapes and immediately began manifesting a demon. Well, this was a major problem because in, in their theology, uh, they didn't have room for Christians having demons. Furthermore, they don't know what to do with a demon now that they had one. <laughs> But in the, in the booklet, I, I explain how to cast out demons. And so this, I got a kind of a humorous letter of how they had to read. <laughs> no, you're doing it wrong, she says. It says here. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> but they got it out. Praise God. Again, uh, I'm touching on each of these to deal with the, the, the reality that we will from time to time have to cast out demons. I, I want to encourage you to further investigation in this area. Uh, we have done some tapes on this subject and there are a number of books that we've uh, brought to the conference that you may want to read. Let's continue with healing of relationships and healing of the dying. In healing of relationships, we have said God has given us precepts in order uh, for our relationships with one another. 
A violation of these precepts results in broken relationship. Therefore, the healing of relationship comes with an exchange of forgiveness and a reapplication of the precepts. Harmonious and interpersonal relationships contribute to the health of the whole community. In the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 15 through 17, we have this statement. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me uh, more than these? And, and he said, yes, Lord. He said, you know uh, that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, I think this is a classic illustration of the, of the dynamic of restoring relationship. This passage is certainly meant to show us that Peter was completely restored to and by Jesus. Peter had three times denied Jesus. He affirmed his love three times, and three times he had been commissioned to care for the flock. Whatever had been the mistakes of Peter, Jesus had restored him to a place of trust. It's also worth noting that the restoration was based on love. Remember, all the one another passages are built on love one another, as referenced in the New Testament. And so, reestablishing of relationships, re the restoration of relationships, is an important aspect of this whole uh, dynamic of social healing. And we must become well versed. Uh, there are a number of scriptures and, and a number of illustrations that I've used in more development, uh, developed presentations on this subject. But one of my favorite stories is the issue between Barnabas, Paul, and John Mark. And you know that on the uh, missionary journey that uh, John Mark had to be turned to uh, loose and Barnabas ultimately went off with him and there was a big hassle between them. I think it's about the 15th or 16th chapter of Acts. And uh, there's a, uh, you know, that Paul has to go off uh, on the second journey by himself as a result. And uh, you see a, a tiff, this tiff has developed a, a rift between uh, the three of them. And yet years later we find that, that uh, as Jesus is... Uh, uh, excuse me, as Paul is writing concerning John Mark, he wants John Mark to come to him because he's a comfort to him and a blessing to him. And you see the, re the restoration of relationship in Barnabas. And so we have illustrated in, very three, in three very spiritual men the, the reality that, uh, that there was a, a problem, a, a, a parting of the ways, and then a restoration of relationship that eventually evolved, although we don't have the specifics of how it was done. And that's another one of those questions I want to ask when I get to heaven. Definition of healing the dying. Death is ultimately man's enemy, and so the first steps toward healing the dying is a proper understanding of death. The idea of being uh, to bring people through the experience of death, both the one dying and the one who is bereaved. We have no model in the scripture, and so what I'm going to give you is, is conjecture, and based on my uh, personal experience as it relates to uh, this kind of thing, let me say before we look at the notes, uh, most of the time when I've been called out to pray for the uh, dying, uh, it's been to the hospital. There have been occasions I've been called to a home. But when you uh, go to the hospital, let me share four or five thoughts that will help you because uh, it's helped me. First of all, when you go to the hospital, you're on someone else's turf. It's the doctor's turf. Unless you're a doctor, you've got a problem. Uh, maybe you have one if you are a doctor, I don't know. But in my case, I found that uh, when I go to the hospital, that one of the first things I do is stand outside and I sort of take stock of who I am. I remind myself that I'm a child of God, that I've been called to heal the sick, commanded in fact, commissioned to minister in His name, that uh, my sins have been forgiven, and if I can think of any at that moment that haven't, I offer them up. And I just sort of tune in to my identity with Jesus Christ. I do that as a matter of routine uh, to prepare myself for entry into the building. Because if I walk into that building without doing that, I won't be 10 feet into that building until I'll feel like a trespasser. The enemy secures that every single time. Now, once I've done step one, and that's sort of just a kind of, kind of clearing the path by... Uh, re reinforcing my identification with Jesus. The second thing I do is I ask Jesus, what is the Father doing 
here with this person. Now, on some occasions, he'll tell me that this person is dying. This is a sickness unto death. When that's true, I, I know that I've got to minister another way. On other occasions, it's, he tells me they're not to die. Sometimes the uh, doctor has said they're going to die. And that creates a little tension. But when you know that they're not supposed to die, that gives you a whole different focal point when you begin ministering. I remember a couple of years ago on, on uh, Christmas night, I received a phone call from a young father in the church. And the moment he got me on the phone, he began just sobbing. And I said, wait a minute, you've got to control yourself. What's wrong? He said, well, my baby, it was a six-month-old baby, is uh, at the hospital, has spinal meningitis, and the doctor said she won't live through the night. Well, as he said that, the Spirit of God, again, it was one of those things where I couldn't have stopped it to save my life. Before he, uh, before he even got the words out, I said, no, she will not die. And then I thought, oh, no, why did I do that? <laughs> you know, now he's going to be all hopeful, and what if she dies, and I'm going to look... And then I thought, wait a minute, that's the devil. And so I rebuked those feelings. I didn't, not on the phone, but I mean, you know, <laughs> privately. And I said, I'll be there as quickly as I can. And so my wife and I hurried down to Orange County Hospital. And when we got there, uh, the child was in intensive care, and, you know, plugged into the machines and things. And, and her little body, her lower torso, torso, legs and things were just swollen, uh, total disproportionately, you know, almost twice their normal size. The nurse that was on duty, uh, as well as a physician that was uh, working that area, did not want to let us in. And there was, a, for a few moments, a little tussle. Now, uh, keep in mind that as I was driving down there, I said, Lord, is this, was that your leading? And he had reassured me, she's not to die. When I got there to the hospital, we took a, Carol and I took a few moments out in the parking lot. And we said, Lord, we know who we are. We're yours. We've been commissioned by you. We've been given authority to minister in your name. We did that on purpose. So when we got in and found out that the uh, nurse and the physician did not want to allow us in, uh, we were a little bolder than we would have normally been. And so finally I, I got into the hallway with the physician. And I said, have, are you and have you done everything you can do for this child? And he said, yes. And I said, well, then let us do what we can do for this child. And he said, you're right. Go on in. And so we went in, and the, when we walked into the room, step three, when we walked into the room, we sensed the presence of death. Now, unless you've ever been in the presence of death, you don't know what I mean. You've been in the presence of life the last few days. You know what that is. Well, death feels like the other side of it. Okay? And so we did what we always do. We rebuked death. We told it to leave. Now, how do you know when it's gone? Well, when life comes. And so we, we walked around in this little room and prayed and prayed and prayed and rebuked death. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God was there. Just a lovely sense of His presence. A peace came over us. And we knew that, that we'd won the first battle. So the first thing you do is remove death. Because if you don't, if you don't remove death, your prayers will have no faith in them. You'll, have, you'll be so inhibited by death's presence. Now keep in mind, death hangs out at the hospital. I know it sounds humorous, but it's the truth. I don't even know what death is exactly. I don't know if it's a, a demonic presence or what it is. I don't know what it is. All I know is you can tell it to go. Somebody asked me one day, well, what's your scriptural basis for that? I have none. But come with me to the hospital. And I'll show you what happens. And so I rebuked the death, death left, and then we went over and laid hands on the child and, and, and prayed. So, first your identity, okay? Who am I in Christ? Second, what is the Father doing in this situation? Third, when we entered into the hospital, we removed death, got it out of the way. Fourth, we ministered healing. Just went over to the child, laid her hands on it, and prayed. We prayed a very brief prayer. I, I don't know that it took a minute to pray the whole prayer. Immediately, we, we, I mean, energy was going through our hands. You, you've seen it now the last few days. We knew that that child was going to get well. 
Then we went outside. The father and mother were waiting in the hall. We talked to them. We said, we think she'll be all right by the morning. They said, really? And I said, yes, I think she'll be all right by the morning. I can't guarantee it. But I, I think God just touched her. I think it's done. And we went home. She was released from the hospital at 10 o'clock that morning. <laughs> On some occasions, we give a post-prayer direction. All right? But in this particular occasion, we didn't have any. Identity in Christ. What's the Father doing? Remove death. Do the ministry. And occasionally, we have some post-prayer direction. So you can see we're, we're following a general outline that you have some familiarity with. Healing the dying. So we said we have no model, and so what we're dealing with here is conjecture, but as it relates to Scripture, we do have the healing of the centurion servants as referenced in Matthew, the 8th chapter, verses 5 through 13. And here the, the centurion came and said, Lord, my servant lies at home, a paralyzed man and in terrible suffering. Jesus said, I will go and heal him. Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me, and I tell this one go and that one come, and he uh, comes and I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feet with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it will be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very hour. Now I don't know, uh, the scripture isn't, uh, doesn't say that the man was dying. I'm just assuming that there was a possibility that he was dying. I do see that in this relationship that the, the centurion understood authority and he understood it in very clear terms. He had been working under and over people for years. And I think that the, one of the major problems that you and I have is we do not fully understand what it means to be authorized by God to work on his behalf. But I tell you that in the name of Jesus, you can forgive sin. When I went out of here a little while ago and stepped into the corridor, a man came to me and as he walked up to me, the Lord said, forgive his sins. And as it turned out, I prayed for him and uh, broke some things in his life and forgave him his sin. And then the Lord told me that he had had a long history of a, of a certain kind of uh, sensuality. And he told me to, to lay hands on him and rebuke the presence of that sensuality and tell it to leave. And when I did, the man retched for a while and it was all over. Now, I tell you that to say this. I've been authorized to do that kind of work. That's the kind of work I do. Heal the sick, cast out devils, break bondage, win the lost, nurture the saved, teach the word of God. And I don't do it well every time. You know, it's like going to bat. I strike out every now and then. Sometimes I can't get a hit to save my life. But I go to bat every time. Get it? I go day after day after day after day. You know, the staff have been kidding me this week. They said, boy, you must really be tired. But see, I do, I do this kind of thing all the time. Sometimes I'll teach 13, 14, 15 times in a week. Sometimes I'll pray for 100 people in one week's time. Now, I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that, that I go to bat over and over and over again, and I don't always get a hit. Sometimes I'm just a miserable speaker, as some of you may well attest. <laughs> and other times I can get it together and I can think clearly and I can, I can say it the way it ought to be said and, it, and it's, it's helpful but I don't spend a lot of time worrying about the times I didn't do well I'm too busy doing it get it? Yeah. when I was sinning I didn't worry about the times I didn't sin as well as other times <laughs> Are you hearing me? I told you, when I worked for the devil, I did his stuff. Now I work for Jesus. I do his stuff. Now I'm committed to doing it. You know, see, I like to do this stuff. 
I like to do it on Monday. People, people always say, don't you take Mondays off? You know, pastors take Mondays off. No, I don't take Mondays off. Because there's too many people around to, to mess with. You know, to, you can heal a few, you know. Hey, there's nothing like healing somebody on, at 10 o'clock Monday morning. <laughs> 11 o'clock's not bad either. <laughs> then you can break for lunch and cast out a few devils. <laughs> I like doing this stuff all week long. It's fun on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and by Thursday or Friday you're warming up for the weekend. <laughs> and it just gets better and better and better. Let me whisper a secret to you. I would do this stuff whether they paid me or not. It has nothing to do with my career. I was a minister a long time before I ever started receiving a paycheck. It has nothing to do with my occupation. Listen to me. It has to do with my passion. I've been called to serve a living God. I've been called to minister. Haven't you? And it's something we must do. We must do. Because if we don't do that, we'll, we'll be back working for that other guy. Won't we? Hello? Won't we? Isn't that what you do when you're not working for Jesus? When you're not busy doing what he does, what do you do? Hello? You know, you take a break and what do you end up doing? Hello? <laughs> you liars, you do too. I've seen you there, you know. <laughs> and so I just like to stay in harness all the time. Let's just do this all the time. Every day. And get our rest and our relaxation in the process of doing it. It's my hobby, it's my habit, it's my vocation. It's my passion. I think you got it. We have other illustration of the healing of the nobleman's son and the dialogue between Jesus and he, found in John 4. Once more he visited Canaan and Galilee where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. And when this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see miracles, signs, and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Don't you love him for that? There's a, there's a mild rebuke in what Jesus had just said. But he wasn't even sensitive to that. He was too preoccupied, too preoccupied with the child's condition to let a little rebuff stop him. I love that. People are always asking me, what motivates me or us to pray for the sick? One thing, compassion. I care about sick people. I want to see them well. Jesus cares about sick people. He wants to see them well. Jesus and I are colleagues. We got a little operation together, a little business. It's called kingdom business. Bringing his kingdom to people that are a little short, that need a little bit of it. Got it? We're in the kingdom business. Bringing the kingdom of God, the reign of God, remember that. The rule of God. Harmonizing with God's will. What is God's will concerning the kingdom? That it be expressed on earth, even as it is in heaven. And so we must carry the kingdom and work the work of the kingdom for those that are not at this time or under it. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus replied, You may go. Your son will live. There's a pronouncement again. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. And while he was still on his way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. And when he inquired as to the time, I think he was just checking, don't you? 
When his son got better, they said to him, the fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour, and the father realized that this was the exact time when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and all of his household believed. There it is, signs and wonders, resulting in evangelism. This was the second miraculous sign that Jesus performed, having come from Judea to Galilee. People, if you go home from this conference, this is a sidelight. If you go home from this conference, and somehow we haven't done the job of presenting to you this one idea, we will have missed it. Underneath everything we do, I'm thinking about compassion. Underneath everything we do, underneath everything we say, is the broken heart of the Father. Our Father's heart is broken. Our Father God's heart is broken for the church and the world today. For years as a Christian, I understood that his heart was broken for the world, but I didn't know it was broken for the church. And until that day that I climbed that hill and that lady cried, I didn't know that the Father's heart was broken for the church and that I was a type of the church and that those tears were for the church. Because the church is so anemic, the church is so insipid and weak and sinful and selfish and limited. You see, we've been born into an inferior Christianity. One time I was trying to dramatize this and I, and I talked about children that were born into captivity to the, to the Israelites. And I said, you know, a little boy... Uh, born in Babylon, he might come home one day and say, Mommy, the kid down the street says we don't belong here. And she'd say, well, that's true, honey. We're, we're Israelites. We should be back in Jerusalem. Well, why, Mommy? Why are we here if we don't belong here? Well, honey, your, your, your daddy and your grandpa sinned. And we're disobedient. And God had to penalize us. And so he allowed us to be captured and brought here in captivity. Well, Mama, am I an Israelite? Do I believe in the true God? Yes, you do, honey. You're, you are an Israelite and, and, a, and a child of Abraham, and you do believe in the true God. But you're in a foreign land, and you're in captivity. In my personal opinion, the church today has been laid captive by the enemy. We are incapacitated people. We're lethargic. We're weak. We're so busy holding our meetings and building our buildings and doing what we do that we've forgotten about the lost world. And more importantly, we're so stinking sinful that we can't hold our heads up when we do have a chance to minister to the lost world. And I think it's time that we repented of that and turned away from the sinfulness that has plagued us and controlled us. You know, I, 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 all the time I was a young man in the church, I heard hundreds of sermons about, about witnessing, you know, how important it was to witness. And boy, if you don't feel bad about that, you ought to. And, you know, when are you going to bring people to church? And, you know, those kinds of guilt-inducing sermons. I used to feel guilty and I witnessed. I was winning people to Christ all the time. But I still felt guilty because I felt the collective guilt of the church. I felt their guilt. I was tuned to it. And it never occurred to me that we didn't have that much to witness about. I, I never realized that we as the church were just not as free as we were supposed to be. I'm not saying that the scripture doesn't give provision. I'm saying that we haven't actualized it. We haven't taken it. Do you realize that this week we've been casting demons of, of pornography and lust and sexual perversion out of pastors all week? We've been taking people back in these back rooms and casting devils out all week. Out of the pulpit, out of the pastors, out of the leaders, 
of the church. And that isn't to say that we didn't have a few other folks back there too. <laughs> and you people are ardent for Christ or you wouldn't even have come to this thing. You're not representative of the whole body. You're not liberal or resistant or against the word of God or nominal or any of those kinds of things. You just wouldn't come to a meeting like that if you were. Or like this if you were. You've come here because you love the Lord and you want to learn and you're ready to, you know, to risk and venture out a little bit. And yet you are besieged by the evil one. Full of filth in your inner man. But thank God we have a Savior that can look past that and loves you. And as the light of the Holy Ghost and as the power of His presence has prevailed here, the darkness has been driven from your being. Yeah. One by one. Lord Jesus, we want freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We want the Spirit. Lord, set us free. Set your church free. Amen. And it's that freedom that we're moving toward. But before we can get there, we have to acknowledge that we're not totally free. And that in itself is a big barrier. Because we're so full of self-righteousness. Aren't we? So proud of our, our position and our place and our heritage and the great men of the past and our labels and all that. But people, we've got to lay that stuff down. That's nonsense. It's hurtful. It's harmful. And we've got to come to Jesus and be one in Him and be refreshed and cleansed and purified and walk with Him in the light so that the world may know that He has been sent of the Father. And the only way I know to do that is that we have to begin acknowledging our sin and coming to Jesus to be cleansed and be released from it. So my prayer for, for myself and for you is that, that we continue to walk with the Lord and walk toward Him, toward the light, that we'd be purified in our inner man and be cleansed. And I, frankly, I don't care at this point in time about my reputation and trying to to maintain anything. And there are times I do care, but right at this moment, moment I don't care. <laughs> because I think I'm among people of no reputation right now. And I like being among those people. And my encouragement to you is that whatever God has had to do to clean you up this week, you just be grateful for it. Yeah. Let's go on to healing of the dead. Definition, resuscitation is the divine miracle of restoring a deceased person back to life. It is the raising of the dead back to a temporal life in the body, as opposed to the resurrection of the dead at the end of the age. It is a visible act of God's power which clearly shows his ability to invade Satan's stronghold, overpower him, on his turf. One of the most powerful illustrations in scripture, of course, is the raising of Lazarus. And since I developed that a little bit the other night, I'm only going to briefly touch on it. But you know the story, you know that, that Jesus was uh, located and communicated with, and the sister sent a message to Jesus that Lazarus was ill, and in, in, in implication was a plea for help. And Jesus had a conviction, or a revelation, or communication, I don't know which, that the ultimate issue of this sickness would not be death, but rather a revelation of the glory of God. And that's referenced in 11.4. And I think we need to take note of the fact that his faith, uh, that he was so calm and controlled. Or at least that's what he evidences in Scripture. 
Jesus knew God was in control. So although he loved Mar Mary and Martha, he stayed where he was two extra days. He was not acting on external evidence, but he waited on his father. In the meantime, Lazarus died. And you know the story about Jesus coming to him and ministering to him. It's one of my favorites in the Bible. As I shared with you the other day, it's something I'm looking forward to doing. Aren't you? Wouldn't that look good on your record? <laughs>